In this, our next to last installment, we look at the Due Process Clause as a source of procedural rights and adjudications conducted by administrative agencies. Recall our Londoner versus Denver case, which held that when an agency acts so that a relatively small number of persons are exceptionally affected upon individual grounds, due process requires that they first be given an evidentiary hearing. This doctrine is of keenest interest where the APA or other non-constitutional sources do not require much in the way of procedural formality. This is especially so with respect to what we have called informal adjudication, what our editors aptly term the dark matter of administrative law practice. The due process clause may require more than what the APA provisions in the adjudication column provide. The Supreme Court noted this in Pension Benefit Guarantee versus LTV Corp where the court wrote, the determination in this case was lawfully made by informal adjudication, the minimal requirements for which are set forth in the APA and do not include sections 556, 557 elements. Informal adjudication. A failure to provide them where the due process clause itself does not require them, which has not been asserted here, is therefore not unlawful. The court had no occasion to address the constitutional question because the party aggrieved by the agency's procedures had not raised it. Recall also that the 14th Amendment's Due Process Clause applies to the states and their political subdivisions. Fifth Amendment applies to the federal sovereign no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Fourteenth Amendment. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. What does due process require? For instruction, we turn now to the celebrated case of Goldberg v. Kelly. This case was brought by recipients under the Aid to Families with Dependent Children Program, or AFDC for short. The issue is defined in precise terms by the court. The constitutional issue to be decided is the narrow one whether the Due Process Clause requires that the recipient be afforded an evidentiary hearing before the termination of benefits. The state of New York already provided a post-termination so-called fair hearing, but the plaintiffs were aggrieved that they had to do without benefits pending that hearing, which might not place, take place for months. We should pause to ask, is a right to AFDC benefits a statutory right or a constitutional right? To which the answer is, it is statutory, not constitutional. Although one of the purposes of the U.S. Constitution is to promote the general welfare, it has never been interpreted to guarantee assistance to needy families. AFDC was a program Congress had chosen to enact. But this raises another question. If AFDC benefits are not a constitutional right, how can there be a constitutional right to a hearing of any kind? The answer is that the due process guarantee stands on its own legs, apart from the nature of the substantive entitlement at issue. The Supreme Court put the point colorfully in the case of cafeteria workers versus McElroy. One may not have a constitutional right to go to Baghdad, but the government may not prohibit one from going unless by due process of law. In Goldberg, the state of New York did not contend that the procedural due process is not applicable to the termination of welfare benefits. And the court added, such benefits are a matter of statutory entitlement for persons qualified to receive them. The issue, though, is when does the state have to hold the hearing? The court concluded, the stakes are simply too high for the welfare recipient and the possibility for honest error or irritable misjudgment too great 
to allow termination of aid without giving the recipient a pre-termination evidentiary hearing. Honest error. Irritable misjudgment. The stakes for the state are high, too. The recipient will probably be judgment-proof, even if no longer eligible for AFDC. But the court found the recipient's need to be more the more pressing. Absent an in-person hearing on the eligibility question, fallible agency officials could easily make a mistake. They would immediately leave a perhaps eligible person without even the resources to take advantage of a post-termination hearing. So due process requires some kind of pre-termination hearing. What kind of hearing? We gather from the Goldberg opinion that due process required the following procedural elements at an AFDC pre-termination hearing. Adequate notice and grounds for termination. The decision maker uninvolved in a prior determination of ineligibility. Oral evidence and argument. Confrontation, perhaps subpoena of witnesses. Cross-examination. Assistance of counsel, self-provided. A decision resting solely upon evidence presented at the hearing. And a statement of reasons for the decision. Suppose, for example, that the caseworker believed that a dependent child had moved out and was no longer living under the recipient's roof. If this was an honest error or an irritable misjudgment, the procedural tools made available on this list could correct the result. We should note, however, that this list does not include everything making up what the court elsewhere terms the full panoply of procedural devices normally associated with adjudicatory hearings. Here are some of those devices. Jury trial, an Article III judge, these are not required, nor is a comprehensive opinion or formal findings, nor a complete record, nor assistance of counsel at state expense, nor are the rules of evidence required, the hearsay rule, for example. And again, there's a question mark next to subpoena of witnesses because the court did not address that and it would take us far afield to settle the issue. To the extent that the burden is on the agency to, to disprove eligibility and hearsay evidence is excluded, subpoenas would add little to the recipient's armory. Is there a way to predict more precisely what due process requires? A subsequent case, Matthews v. Eldridge, offers some guidance. In Matthews v. Eldridge, the issue was whether due process requires a pre-termination hearing under the Social Security Disability Benefit Program. If this sounds a lot like the framing of the issue in Goldberg, it is. In Goldberg, the constitutional issue to be decided is the narrow one whether the due process clause requires that the recipient be afforded an evidentiary hearing before the termination of benefits. And in Matthews, the issue in this case is whether the Due Process Clause requires that prior to the termination of Social Security Disability Benefit payments, the recipient be afforded an evidentiary hearing. In Goldberg, the recipient won on the issue, but in Matthews, the recipient loses. We have a chance to see what the due process analysis turns on. The Matthews Court tells us Identification of the specific dictates of due process generally requires consideration of three distinct factors. The private interest involved, the governmental interest, and the error avoidance value of the additional procedural safeguard. The plaintiff might wish to have a hearing that includes the full panoply of procedural devices, but Matthews teaches that each omitted device as to which a right is claimed will be scrutinized. The Matthews court distinguishes Goldberg in these very terms. The private interest in a pre-termination hearing might seem equally great in both cases. In fact, the expected delay in Matthews before a post-termination hearing was held was significantly longer. 
the delay between the actual cutoff of benefits and final decision after hearing exceeds one year. But a longer delay did not mean a greater setback to the private interest because the worker's household unit can qualify for food stamps if it meets the financial need requirements. Social Security disability eligibility, unlike AFDC, was not means-tested. If due to some medical impairment Jeff Bezos could no longer work, he could get Social Security disability. Is there no other private interest at stake? The court says no. Since a recipient whose benefits are terminated is awarded full retroactive relief if he ultimately prevails, his sole interest is in the uninterrupted receipt of this source of income pending final administrative decision on his claim. And evidently, the government's sole interest is in protecting the public fist, since the recipient is likely to be judgment-proof. Unlike in Goldberg, there's not a word in the Matthews opinion about the public interest in not letting the destitute be driven to the wall. Contrast the D.C. Circuit's inventory of values served. An oral hearing provides a way to ensure accuracy, particularly if credibility is an issue. It serves to ensure that decision makers recognize that their decisions affect the lives of human beings and thus is a powerful disincentive to arbitrary action. And third, and perhaps most importantly, it fosters a belief that one has been dealt with fairly. Great Panthers may still be good D.C. Circuit law, but it is not the law of the land. Matthews is. Finally, what about the error avoidance value of an oral hearing? The Matthews Court writes that an oral hearing would add little in the Social Security disability context. In the court's words, the conclusions of physicians often are supported by x-rays and the results of clinical or laboratory tests, information typically more amenable to written than to oral presentation. To be sure, credibility and veracity may be a factor in the ultimate disability assessment in some cases, but procedural due process rules are shaped by the risk of error inherent in the truth-finding process as applied to the generality of cases, not the rare exceptions. All three of the factors in the Matthews calculus are to be weighed as applied to the generality of cases. The dissents protest that this recipient was bankrupted and homeless due to his interrupted flow of benefits was to no avail. At least he wasn't homeless in Baghdad. <laughs>